Today's scripture reading is from John's plural. The first passage is 1 John 1, 1 to 4. We, pl- we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him, and now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. The other verse is John twenty nineteen to 31. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me. So I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless the nail, I see the nail wounds in his hands. Put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But these are, the written, these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have the power of his name. Thank you, Michael. Good morning. Well, last week and this week uh, have been such great times of celebration together. We celebrated the fact that Jesus went toe-to-toe with with death on our behalf. We celebrated the uh, resurrection of Jesus uh, with uh, the biggest breakfast I think I've ever had. So thank you for everyone that contributed to that. Uh, And this morning, what a joy to celebrate the baptism of, of Gordon and his decision to follow Jesus in the waters of baptism. Uh, These celebrations are some of the highlights of living our Christian faith. Uh, But between these celebrations, what do we do when we're haunted with with questions and doubts, with the the hard blows of life? Uh, What do we do when disillusion settles over us? Because the the experience of following Jesus uh, didn't measure up to, to our hopes. Our gospel reading this morning brings us face-to-face with Thomas, who wrestled with these very kinds of things. So what can he teach us about developing deeper faith uh, in those shadowy moments between those times of celebration? Now, the the gospels don't give us a very broad picture of the life of Thomas. He's only mentioned once in, in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, and only as one of the names of the 12 disciples. And in the book of Acts, we we learn that he was present when the disciples uh, chose a replacement for Judas, uh, but that's it. Uh, Now, in the Gospel of John, he shows up four times, uh, most famously in the passage we read today, which has earned him the nickname Doubting Thomas, uh, unless I see the nail marks in his hands. Uh, But every time John mentions Thomas, he, noticed, he, he notes that Thomas, or, Thomas had another name, and that other name was Didymus. Thomas is Aramaic, and Didymus is Greek, and they both mean exactly the same thing. They mean twin. That's the meaning of his name. So Thomas had a twin sibling 
Uh, now, there's been speculations about who this twin was, but we really don't know. And I wonder if his twin might be among us here this morning. Maybe not in the biological sense, but in the sense that we share some of the same character traits, uh, some of the same questions, some of the same loyalties. As much as Thomas has been branded Doubting Thomas, we might also call him Dedicated Didymus. Uh, Thomas first shows up in John's Gospel in chapter 11 where Jesus learns that Lazarus, his good friend, is on his deathbed. And Jesus wants to go back to Lazarus in the village of Bethany, uh, but the, obje- the, the disciples object. They're, they're saying to him, uh, Jesus, you know, uh, the Pharisees, they just tried to stone you in that village. Why in the world would you want to go back there? But Jesus was determined to do this, and so finally Thomas spoke up and said to the rest of the disciples, well, let's all go along so that we can die with them. You wouldn't be wrong to think that this isn't a very enthusiastic response. They just don't see the point of going back, and it's dangerous for Jesus. And by now, they've come to realize that Lazarus has actually died. But understand or not, uh, Thomas has decided to stick with Jesus through thick or thin. As far as he's concerned, it's a bad idea, but if if Jesus is, is going, he's going with him. And he convinces the rest of the disciples to go along as well. The death of Jesus must have been devastating for Thomas, who was willing to follow Jesus anywhere. With all of his doubts and all of his questions, uh, he doesn't cut to the chase and run after the crucifixion of Jesus, to his credit. And maybe he's hoping against hope that somehow there will be something redemptive about all of this. Uh, some way to honor the ministry that Jesus modeled so well. I wonder, have you ever followed Jesus when it didn't make sense to do so? Maybe you've decided to love your enemy, uh, even though he didn't feel like it. Uh, Maybe you've kept serving, though it isn't fun anymore, because you sense it's what Jesus wants you to do. Maybe like Mother Teresa, you continue to serve in a thankless work for years on end without ever feeling any sense of the presence of God. Maybe you're not even a believer yet, but your curiosity or your hunger keeps you investigating the life of Jesus, keeps you coming back to a church service. If any of these describe you, uh, maybe you're related to Thomas, the dedicated follower following even when it's hard, even when it makes little sense, uh, even when we're not fully committed, is one of the ways that we deepen our faith. We don't get very far just by talking about Jesus. We need to go where he goes and do what he does. That's how our faith grows deeper. Now, the next time Thomas shows up in John's Gospel uh, is at the Last Supper, and Jesus has washed the feet of his disciples. He's predicted the betrayal of Judas. He's predicted the denial of Peter, so it's kind of a heavy, heavy mealtime. And then he tries to encourage the disciples by telling them that he is going away to prepare a place for them. He says, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And that sounds very beautiful, very poetic almost when you read it in John's Gospel. But to the disciples who are listening, it must have sounded like an impossible riddle. And it's Thomas who is bold enough to speak up and ask the question that likely all of them were thinking, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we possibly know the way? And I wonder if there was a dramatic pause at that point in the conversation. I wonder if the other disciples were thinking to themselves, did he really just call into question what Jesus told us? Doesn't he know that he's supposed to just nod and pretend that he understands? But I'm so glad that he asked that question because Jesus' response to Thomas' question is one of the most frequently quoted uh, statements in the New Testament. And I think I have it on the screen. Jesus answered in this way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. 
And by the way, this is such an important statement about what God is like. If your image of God is anything like Jesus, if, if your image of God is, is not anything like Jesus, then your image of God is somewhat distorted. Would we have such a clear statement of the significance of Jesus' life and what God is like if Thomas, if Thomas hadn't asked that question? How can we know the way? So he did us all a huge favor. More often than not, when I was in school or when I attended a lecture or seminar, I wouldn't raise my hand in class and ask my question because um, I was uh, embarrassed. I thought maybe it was a stupid question. I thought maybe the question I had wasn't really important to anybody but me. Um, but the most recent course I took, uh, so I'd, I'd wait till the end of the class and everybody else was gone, and then I'd go up and, and talk to the teacher. But in the most recent course I took, it was online, it was live, uh, and when the class was done, they hit the off button, and there was no chance to ask questions after the class was over. And so I was getting better at putting up my hand in question period, the way you do that on Zoom, and ask my questions. And frequently in the small groups that would follow the lecture period, uh, the other classmates in my small group would say, I'm so glad you asked that question because I was wondering the same thing. So if you're that person who is not afraid to ask questions at the risk of looking stupid or worse, heretical, uh, then maybe you're related to Thomas. And thank God for people like you who are willing to ask tough questions. Socrates, uh, Socrates apparently said that the unexamined life is not worth living. And I would say that the unexamined faith is not worth practicing. Our faith is full of mystery, things that are difficult to understand, but it's not unreasonable, and our faith won't be broken by your questions. Our faith is deepened when we're willing, like Thomas, to ask questions, uh, even if the answers are obvious to everybody else. But our questions have to come from a place of honest curiosity, not from a place of scorn, not from a place of mocking. That's not really questioning. That's just uh, criticizing. By the way, if you have questions about the gospel, you may want to sign up for the uh, small group that I'm leading starting next week on the veracity of the gospels. Can we trust to them? Do we know that they're reliable? We'll be meeting from next Sunday till uh, the middle of June. Uh, so if you're interested in that, come and join us here 7 o'clock on Sunday evenings. There's so much we can learn from Thomas, but um, when we put the few descriptors that we have together of him, you kind of get the picture of uh, a, a glass half-empty kind of a guy. Well, let's all go out and die with Jesus. Jesus, how can we, get to, how can we go where you are if we don't even know where you're going? I won't believe it unless I see the nail scars, or unless I touch the, the uh, nail scars in your hands. Sometimes pessimistic people uh, will withdraw when life gets difficult. And Thomas was undoubtedly devastated at the death of Jesus. When Jesus appeared to the disciples in the evening of the first day of his resurrection, the text says that Thomas was not with them. Now, we don't know where he was, but he couldn't have been very far because the, t the other disciples came and told him about their appearance, that they're, they're meeting Jesus. But why wasn't he there when all the disciples were gathered? Was he too grief-stricken? Did he feel like he just needed to be alone? Did he chafe at the thought of eating and drinking and socializing with the rest of the group when his whole life had been turned upside down? We don't know for sure. What we do know is that the Lord appeared to the disciples when they were gathered, but the Lord did not appear to Thomas while he was alone. Now, the next Sunday, a week later, uh, they were gathered again, and Thomas was with them this time, and the Lord appeared again. And having missed the first Sunday night, Thomas didn't see the Lord for a full week after his resurrection. Now, I don't want to make too much of this, but there's something about the gathered community where we experience the presence of the Lord. And Jesus himself said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. 
If you have a tendency to withdraw when you're going through a hard time, uh, if you have a tendency just to stay home when the rest of the worshiping community is, is gathering, uh, you may be related to Thomas. And you may be missing an encountering, uh, you may be missing an encounter with, with the presence of Jesus. It's one of my own deep convictions that spiritual growth happens in the context of relationships. And that's why so much of the New Testament has to do with how we relate to one another. In the gathered community, whether it's two or uh, 200, we encounter Christ in a way that's next to impossible when we're alone. We need each other, especially when we're in those places of suffering and brokenness. It's in our relationship with others that we encounter the living Christ. We come finally to Thomas's extreme skepticism that, that earned him the name uh, Tom, Doubting Thomas. And to be fair, he wasn't the only disciple who'd had doubts. We know from the Gospel of Luke that when Mary and the other women told the disciples that Jesus had risen, uh, they didn't believe them. <clears throat> they said they, we, they thought their words were nonsense. So we need to cut Thomas a little bit of slack here about his own doubts. So when Jesus appears to the frightened disciples while they're meeting behind the locked doors, and they see the scars in his hands and in his side, and they're overjoyed. Imagine their excitement <clears throat> as they run to share with the, the good news with Thomas. We've seen the Lord. Surely this will cheer him up. But no, the testimony is not enough. How could he refute what they had seen with their own eyes? Well, maybe they were hallucinating because they wanted so badly for Jesus to have been risen from the dead. Maybe they met a clever imposter. Maybe, maybe an apparition. Maybe, who knows? His response <clears throat> goes beyond cautious skepticism. He might have said, well, fellas, that sounds unusual. Tell me more. But no, this is willful disbelief. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were, I will not believe. I will not believe. He's not the least bit willing to trust the testimony of these closest companions. He wants his own firsthand experience. The amazing thing to me about this story is that Jesus actually accommodates even Thomas's willfulness. The compassionate Jesus doesn't treat everyone using the same formula, but he deals with each of us according to our need. And in most cases, he gives us a lot more than we need. Mary, at the empty tomb, was convinced of Jesus' resurrection when she heard the sound of his voice calling her name. The other disciples see Jesus, they see the scars, and they're convinced. And Thomas needed to touch the wounds before he would be convinced. I'm so glad that we have Thomas among the disciples. He speaks to the skeptics among us. In case anyone thought the resurrection of Jesus was a fabrication that the disciples kind of created, Thomas holds them to account, refusing to believe anything that he can't verify for himself. And Jesus doesn't, doesn't chastise uh, Thomas for his skepticism. He graciously accommodates him. In fact, I think... Here's another case where Jesus goes above and beyond the evidence that Thomas demands. So the next time Thomas and the other disciples are gathered, Jesus appears among them as he did the first time. The doors are locked. He shows up in the room. And before Thomas can say a word, Jesus says to him, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. He knew what Thomas had demanded before Thomas even entered the room. He spoke what was on the mind and the heart of Thomas. And Thomas was thoroughly convinced, thoroughly convicted. We're not even sure that he bothered to touch the scars that Jesus offered for him to touch before he spoke the strongest confession of Jesus' divinity that we have on the lips of any of the disciples. My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. 
He recognized in that moment that Jesus and God were one and the same person. You know, sometimes it's the greatest skeptics that make the greatest defenders of the faith. I think of people like uh, Lee Strobel. I think I've got his picture on the screen here. He was an investigative journalist um, for the Chicago Tribune. Uh, And he set out to debunk Christianity after his wife became a Christian. And in the course of trying to debunk Christianity, he became thoroughly convinced that Jesus was who he said he was. And he went on to write The Case case for Christ and and several other uh, defenses of the Christian faith, well worth reading. Or a person like Nicky Gumbel. Some of you know him from the Alpha program. Uh, Nicky was a a Jewish lawyer, a non-believer, completely opposed to the Christian faith. And his roommate roommate at the time was was an atheist. Um, But his roommate met a Christian girl and his roommate was converted to Christ. Nicky thought they had lost their minds. He felt sorry for them, and he'd said, he decided he'd set out to prove for them how, what nonsense this was to try to pull them out of this cult. And so he went to work, and in the course of trying to disprove the claims of Christ, he became thoroughly convinced that Jesus Christ was, in fact, the Son of God and uh, dedicated the rest of his life to telling the world that through the Alpha program. You may be related to Thomas if you are the consummate skeptic. And I urge you to keep an open mind and an open heart. Don't let willful disbelief become such a hard shell that nothing can penetrate it. And if you know a hard-shelled skeptic, uh, remember that nothing is impossible with God. Keep praying for them. I wonder if there was another reason for Thomas wanting to touch the wounds of Jesus. Thomas needed to know maybe that the risen Christ is not an untouchable reality. What could he have in common with someone who appears out of nowhere, with someone who recovers from death? What hope did Thomas have of ever becoming anything like that kind of a master. Uh, Someone who lives in a completely different reality. And maybe Thomas needed to know that the risen Christ was continuous with the Jesus that he he always knew. Still human, still someone who understands our pain and suffering, still someone who is the perfect example of what we are to become, scars and all. Our Jesus didn't skirt around death, He took it on head on. He overcame death, not only for himself, but for everyone who follows him. His resurrected life is the life that Jesus Christ is calling us into. Thomas was convinced by the resurrected Jesus and the promise of a new kind of life that everyone could experience. He was so convinced by this that he gave up his life preaching the good news. I have a a slide on the screen about this. He was martyred as the first known missionary to South India. And like Jesus, he will rise again. So you may be related to Thomas, and this is the last slide, uh, Tyler. Uh, You may be related to Thomas if you ask Jesus clarifying questions about the things that you don't understand. You may be related to Thomas if you're not willing to settle for second-hand experience of Jesus. You may be related to Thomas if you have a Savior, or if you need a Savior who can show you what it means to be human and to be at peace in the midst of the struggles and the realities of human life. You may be related to Thomas if you're willing to follow Jesus anywhere. And this morning I want to say, take heart, friends. There's uh, room in Jesus' fold for a doubting Thomas. But may I encourage you also to let go of willful disbelief and open your heart to the mystery of this new life that Jesus longs to give to you. If you've made a, never made a confession of faith and, and you feel the Spirit tugging at your heart this morning, there's still water in the tank. It's not too late to be baptized. We'll wait around. I've got dry clothes in the closet, extra towels. And while we're singing the last song, 
here in just a moment. I'll call you up, Lindsay. Uh, if you want to be baptized this morning, uh, there's, there's water in the tank, and we'd be happy to stay around. Um, but again, uh, be generous in your response to God. Ask your questions, but not out of a place of scorn, out of a place of true curiosity.